Members may not know, but I got a lot of help from Wibco when I was a young child. Anyhow, oral questions, questions orales. L'honorable, excuse-moi, l'honorable député de Regina Capel. Honorable member for Regina Capel. After eight years, the Prime Minister is not worth the cost or the crime, and now extortion is the latest crime wave plaguing our communities. When common sense Conservatives were in office, we toughened penalties for dangerous and repeat offenders, and as a result, the crime rate went down. Turns out when thugs don't when thugs fear getting caught, they commit fewer crimes. Extortion is up all across the country thanks to easier penalties and easier bail. Will the government finally admit? the mistake of their previous crime legislation, adopt common sense conservative policies to keep criminals off the street. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, no surprise the Conservatives don't want to talk about the economy this morning because we've had a blockbuster of good news. The job numbers released today by Stats Canada show that Canada gained 37,000 new jobs in January. Unemployment is down to 5.7 percent. And get this, get this, Mr. Speaker, wages have increased by 5.3 percent in January. Among women, 6.2 percent. We are bringing home big pay checks for Canadians who are all at work, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's no wonder the Liberals don't want to talk about crime because our communities across the country are becoming less safe. It's a direct result from the Liberal legislation which reduced penalties. Their bill, C-5, actually eliminated a mandatory jail sentence for people who commit extortion. As a result, extortion is up dramatically. Get this, Mr. Speaker. It's up 366 percent in B.C. This is extortion. People are now losing their, lively, their, their property and their money because gangsters are extorting them in Canada after eight years of this Prime Minister. When will he put an end to his soft on crime approach? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, there, it's such good news that we're going to repeat the good news in the other official language. In January, there was great news for Canadians. The economy, we created 37,000 jobs in January. The unemployment rate has dropped to 5.7 percent. Wages rose 5.3 percent in January. And for women in January, wages increased by 6.2 percent. We are giving Canadians good paychecks. We are here for Canada, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to remind all members that, uh, as some uh, previous speakers have put it, it's question period, not necessarily answer period. Uh, the Honourable Member from Regina Capel. This is a slap in the face to every single victim of violent and dangerous crime in this country. The Liberals are running around telling Canadians that they've never had it so good. Meanwhile, business owners and families are being extorted extorted, Mr. Speaker, in Canada, a developed G7 country, now sees extortion rates as high as 218 percent up nationally, 262 percent increase in Ontario. And all the Liberals can do is get up and tell Canadians how good they've had it. When will the Liberals put the rights of victims first and honest Canadians and put dangerous criminals behind bars where they belong? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, far too Canadians have been experiencing this um, situation. It is precisely why the RCMP is seized with this issue, working with, directly with local police. Mr. Speaker, this is something we're seeing uh, operating with organized crime. But what we also know is the conservative tough talk on crime doesn't actually create the solutions and the results. We've seen that as they've cut funding to the RCMP to do this very work, to crack down on organized crime, but we're going to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this government, house prices and rents have doubled. And according to the director of Le Bercail in Saint-Georges, Cathy Fecteau, the number of homeless people has also doubled. Everything has doubled under this Prime Minister, who is not worth the cost. The Le Bercail shelter offers temporary accommodation. Residents are generally allowed to stay for 30 days, but given the current problems, some residents have been there for over 70 days. Why doesn't the Prime Minister build more housing instead of more bureaucracy? 
The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for his important question. For those in both who are watching us today, they will notice that the government takes housing very seriously. We are reaching deals with provinces to build more housing. And as my colleague was saying, we have good news. The economy is doing well, and that will help Canadians everywhere in Canada. And another piece of good news, Mr. Speaker, Canada ranked not second, not third, but first for uh, the battery chain. So we are investing in Canadians and in Quebecers and in the future of Canada. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, that reply just proves how out of touch this government is. They're asleep at the wheel. They need to get out of the way so that municipalities can build affordable housing, just as Victoriaville, Saguenay and Trois-Rivières have done. Due to the lack of housing and resources, the Bercaille shelter in the riding next to mine has had to close its doors. As a result, the community is facing an increase in homelessness. When will the government help our rural communities to build affordable housing. The Honourable Transportation Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives want to talk about housing. They wouldn't even be able to build a small cabin. They insult the mayors of Quebec. They've insulted the mayor of Montreal, the mayor of Quebec. They're insulting mayors all over the place. While they're doing that, we signed a $900 million deal with Quebec, including $1.8 million to speed up home building, not just in Montreal and Quebec and Trois-Rivières, but everywhere throughout Quebec. And that's teamwork. That's collaboration. The Honourable Member for saint laberry sur roy The media crisis has now affected another part of our democracy and media landscape. 4,800 jobs will be cut at Bell. That's in addition to all the cuts at Media Corps and Radio-Canada CBC. The industry has been crumbling for years because the federal government has not taken significant action. Meanwhile, the regulatory framework at the CRTC has not been advancing. Now, C18 is positive. We accept cuts for Google, but these job losses are ongoing. When will the minister take action? The Honourable Canadian Heritage Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to remind my Bloc Québécois colleague that we have taken action since we formed government in 2015. In fact, we have collaborated very well with the Bloc Québécois on many files. The colleague mentioned the CRTC and the Act. It took us three years to pass that legislation because the Conservatives opposed it every step of the way. And the same goes for the Online News Act. Conservatives engaged in so much obstruction. Meanwhile, we are trying to help media. The Honourable Member for salaberry sur roy Ottawa needs to take action while there are still jobs to save. We need an emergency fund to prevent further funding. We need a tax credit for announcers in traditional media. We need to increase ad investment investments for traditional media and decrease of liberal investments going into the pockets of Meta. We also need a prime minister who takes action rather than just being satisfied with blaming the Conservatives. When will they act? The Honourable Canadian Heritage Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to remind my colleague that we have taken action and thanks to all of our efforts, we were able to modernize the Broadcasting Act and no one thought we would manage to get a deal with Google, but we got $100 million a year plus interest and it will be indexed to inflation. Also, Mr. Speaker, we implemented tax credits to support newsrooms. We implemented a fund for local journalism. Mr. Speaker, we don't want to help big businesses get richer and richer like the Conservatives would do. We will continue to support journalism, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Burnaby, New Westminster. Labrador, the Liberals have let the housing crisis get so bad that the province is forced to buy up hotels to house people who live in tents. This government's inaction has made provinces resort to desperate, improvised measures. Canadians deserve to live in dignity, in safe, secure, affordable homes they can call their own, not in tents in the coldest climate on earth. 
When will this government start stepping up to provide solutions to the St. John's housing crisis so that people don't have to live in tents anymore? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Everyone in this country has a right to housing, and it's unacceptable that any Canadians are sleeping out in the cold. That's why we've doubled funding. Uh, to help community tackle homelessness and recently announced $100 million to help protect the most vulnerable 85 communities across the country. Um, our investments uh, throughout our time in government are paying off. We prevented over 125,000 people from becoming unhoused and placed over 71,000 people experiencing homelessness in permanent housing. We're ready to work with parties that are serious about housing. I'd like to thank the honourable member for his question. There's a lot more work to do. We're up to the task. The Honourable Member from Nanaimo Ladysmith. Mr. Speaker, people in Nanaimo Ladysmith are relying on food banks now more than ever before. And what is this Liberal and, co and Conservative corporate coalition doing? Pointing fingers at one another over who has the most grocery lobbyists in their back pocket. To make matters worse, the Liberals voted against an NDP bill that would lower food cost prices uh, and crack down on out-of-control corporate greed. Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals working for large grocery CEOs instead of doing what's right for people. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say thank you to my colleague for a very important question. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm a bit confused by, by the question because, in fact, we are the one pushing uh, the grocery industry to do more for Canadians, and I welcome the help of the NDP. Not only we did that in, in our last reform of competition, but we have included amendments that have been proposed by the, the NDP, Mr. Speaker. We want to do more, and we understand, and all experts understand, that the best way to have more options to stabilize price, to make sure that we have a more competitive environment, Mr. Speaker, is to reform our competition law. That's exactly what we're doing, and we thank the NDP for their help. The Honourable Member from Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, farmers across the country are struggling under this punishing carbon tax. Melissa, a farmer in my area, paid over $6,000 in carbon taxes just to dry her wow. grain last year. And now the Prime Minister wants to quadruple the tax just in a few years. He isn't worth the cost. When will this Liberal government get out of the way and pass Bill C-234 in its original form, get off farmers' backs, and make our food affordable again? Here, here, here. The Honourable, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the bill was so important, I would, uh, I would uh, counsel my Honourable colleague to let them know that five Conservative Senators were missing in action when it came down to that important, important vote. What we're doing on this side of the House, we believe in climate change. I have yet to hear one single platform or policy related to climate change. 20% in 2021, 20% of grains didn't make it to market because of climate change. On this side of the house, we have a plan to fight climate change and we have a plan to support farmers. The Honourable Member from Sturgeon River Parkland. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's rich coming from this government that relentlessly lobbied senators to block Bill C-234. Bill C-234 removes the carbon taxes off the farmers who grow our food. And we know inflation is hitting Canadians hard, whether it's housing, the cost of fuel and food. Everything is getting more expensive under this NDP Liberal government. And after eight years, Canadians know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. And the only way that Canadians will get the tax relief they deserve is is by electing a common sense conservative government. So when will these liberals call the election so we can axe the tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Well, Mr. Speaker, the truth comes out. They want to go into an election. Nobody, nobody, no Canadian wants to go into an election right now. And I will remind and again, our support for farmers has been consistent. We supported our supply managed sector. We supported our farmers' help transition towards a greener economy. That's why we've invested $1.5 billion that helps farmers directly on the land to, to ensure that they, they, they can uh, pr provide some technology for farmers. The Honourable Member from Yorkton, Melville. Speaker, the biggest petition in Canadian history proves that person wrong. <laughs> Ray Orb, a Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, has indicated that our farmers can expect to lose 8% of their total net income if the carbon tax is quadrupled this spring. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. The cost to our growers, our truckers and everyone who is struggling to put healthy food on the tables of their families. Will this Prime Minister choose a death now, alienating Canadians even? further or will they grab a, sorry, grab a lifeline and support C234? <laughs>
The Honorable P Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's absurd to be lectured by the Conservative Party on our support for farmers when just last month we saw them vote against the On-Farm Climate Action Fund, the Dairy Innovation and Investment Fund, and funding in support of dairy, poultry, and egg supply managed producers. Those Conservatives take farmers for granted. They stand up in this House saying that climate policy is affecting food prices when they know it's not true because their own food professor comes to committee to say that exact thing, that climate policy is not a main driver of food prices. What is? Climate change, Mr. Speaker, but they never talk about climate change. They okay, won't yeah. provide any solutions for climate change. It's an all, all red herring to this Conservative Party. The Honourable Member from Yorkton Melville. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our farmers are tired of this government talking out of both sides of its mouth. This Prime Minister is demanding that our farmers absorb a quadrupling of the carbon tax and GSD. And yet, grow enough grain to stay solvent, feed the world, and increase green fuel alternatives. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, farmers know where they stand. Is he even aware of how many Canadians have had enough of his t attacks on farmers? He's not worth the cost. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Farmers are the first to be impacted by climate change, and we need to support them and their transition to greener fuels, as the member said. However, we've already done many of those things by exempti exempting gas and diesel from farm use for uh, pollution pricing. We've created a rural top-up for rebates, and we've returned over $120 million to farmers in just in 2023, thanks to carbon pricing proceeds. But, Mr. Speaker, today is the, the warmest January day on record, and last year was the warmest year on record ever. Wheat yields are down, climate change is having an impact, it's through droughts, floods, there are a variety of ways that climate change are affecting food prices, but you'll never hear that from the Conservative Party of Canada. The Honourable Member from Portage Lisker. The Liberals are determined to increase the price of food, with the Environment Minister making it his personal mission to kill Bill C-234. He admitted to lobbying six senators to gut the bill and promised to reveal those names. After 49 days, he gave the names of three, not six senators. While I know the Liberals aren't good at math, it's clear he provided misleading information. So this week, I invited the Minister of Environment to our committee to explain himself. But the NDP Liberal Coalition shut it down because they don't want the truth. So let me ask it here. Why is the Environment Minister going to such great lengths to hide the names of the senators that he personally lobbied to gut Bill C-234? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's a little rich hearing from the Conservative Party when Conservative senators sit in their caucus and one of those senators was accused of bullying to the point where independent senators were afraid to go home at night. Shame on that Conservative Party for bullying those senators. It's absolutely shameful that any member of government should fear for their safety Shame. as a result of that, of that government. But I'll say it again, Mr. Speaker, carbon pricing is not to blame for Canada's affordability challenges. We are serious about helping Canadians afford their grocery bills. Fighting climate change policy is not the way. The Honourable Member from Portage Lisker. The Liberals love to try to distract their way out of this, but this isn't monopoly. There's no more get out of jail free cards for this environment minister. The price of food is at record levels, and this NDP government just doesn't care. Just this week, Sylvain Charlebois, Canada's leading food expert, called on the Liberals to suspend the carbon tax on the entire food industry. Instead, this cover-up coalition plans to increase the carbon tax by 23% on April 1st. Bill C-234 would provide relief for farmers and Canadian consumers. Yet this radical environment minister told senators to gut it. My question is simple. Which senators did he call and how do they vote on Bill C-234? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, it's obvious to us, and I hope it's obvious for Canadians, that what they're talking about is nonsense. Mr. Speaker, Sylvain Charlebois is working with us, Mr. Speaker, in order to make sure that we take the right step to bring stability in prices of food in Canada. The first thing that was asked from us, Mr. Speaker, was to reform competition. That's what we have done in a landmark uh, bill that we passed in December, and we're going to do more. Now we have subpoena power for the Competition Bureau. We removed the restrictive covenant in leases. Mr. Speaker, we're going to fight for consumers at every step of the way, and we have nothing to learn from these guys. Deputy de Montcalm. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. It's been one year since the Special Committee on Medical Assistance in Dying recommended that advance requests be allowed. Advance requests, in fact, there was a strong consensus for them among members of all parties on the committee. 
we must allow advance requests for those suffering from cognitive disorders such as dementia and Alzheimer's. For a year now, the federal government has been dragging its feet in implementing the committee's strongest recommendation. Why? The Honourable Transportation Minister. Mr. Speaker, Quebec is a leader when it comes to medical assistance in dying, and we know that MAID is very important to the government of Quebec and to Quebecers, and it's important for the government of Canada too. But we do need to reflect on this because legally it will be very difficult to move forward on this, but that does not prevent us from continuing our discussions not only with the province of Quebec, but with all provinces and territories. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, medical assistance in dying is a matter of free choice. The Liberals should understand that. The role of the state is to create the conditions for a free and informed choice. Those who do not want medical assistance in dying need not ask for it. It's as simple as that. The National Assembly is unanimous. Quebec is ready. Quebec has its own law. Will the federal government amend the criminal code to allow advance requests for Quebecers who are suffering? Go ahead. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, of course we are aware of all issues related to medical assistance in dying. I would like to repeat to my colleague and to the Parliament that we need a bill before this House. There is a deadline, March 17th, a deadline to suspend some things. But that deadline extension reflects a consensus from the mixed committee on MAID. Now, we will continue to study the matter of advance requests, but we do have our deadline. Wiscana. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal NDP government, this Prime Minister and his carbon tax are not worth the cost. That's because when you tax the farmer who grows the food, and you tax the trucker who trucks the food, and you tax the grocer who refrigerates the food, all of those carbon taxes get passed on to consumers. Now this Prime Minister wants to increase the carbon tax another 23% on April 1st. Mr. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister give Canadians a break and cancel his inflationary carbon tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member raised a good, an important point. He knows very well, if he was at the Agriculture Committee this week, that there is no evidence to suggest that carbon pricing is increasing the, f the price of food. The evidence shows that climate change it has an impact on the price of food. And when the leader of the official opposition goes around Canada, the only thing he wants to axe is axe the agriculture budget on the backs of farmers. Yeah. Oh. The Honourable Member from Bow River. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost of groceries. The University of Saskatchewan study said Canadian farmers are at least 60 percent less emissions than the average of the world. I attended an irrigation conference this week of hundreds of farmers like Rob who told me it cost them tens of thousands in carbon tax to operate irrigation. And there is no rebate. And they all want it gone. When will NDP Liberals give farmers and families a break pass? C234 and axe tax. Great question. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Mr. Speaker, slogans will not help farmers. On this side of the House, we've always believed that supporting farmers is important, and that's why we've invested 25 percent more in the agricultural budget, something that the leader of the official opposition cut while he was sitting at the cabinet table. Maybe the honourable member should have a conversation with the leader of the official opposition, because I haven't yet seen an agricultural policy from the Conservative Party of Canada. <laughs> The Honourable Member from Central Okanagan, Similkami Nicola. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Kelowna is in housing hell. Rents have doubled. Mortgage payments have tripled. Tent cities and long lineups of food banks are now commonplace. The Housing Minister touts investing millions in Kelowna through his Housing Announcement Fund, or HALF. Can the Minister please share specifically how many homes in Kelowna, funded by last October's announcement, will be start construction this year, or has he been too preoccupied with polls, press releases and photo ops, the point he's too clever by half? 
Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm hoping the Honourable Member will uh, come with me to uh, 651 Cambridge Avenue in Kelowna yeah. to see a 75-unit construction, $4.6 million invested in the city of Kelowna, that he voted against. Mr. Oh, no Speaker, we're we getting housing we built in this credit. country. Time and time again, the Conservatives pretend during this hour of the day during question period to care about housing, but when it comes to voting on funding, they're absent. They vote against funding, and when it, they've promised that when they form government, they will cut all funds, raise taxes on builders. We're going to get the job done. We're serious about housing. The Honourable Member from Central Okanagan, Samukmin Nikola. You can't give a number because they didn't require it. Kelowna's half action plan only refers to, when I quote, investments in affordable housing, such as land acquisition, investments in housing related infrastructure, such as sewer and water, and investments in community related infrastructure that supports housing, such as sidewalks, bridges, and bike lanes. Does the Parliamentary Secretary understand that this joke of a program funds sewers and bike lanes, but doesn't require the construction of a single home? Is he comfortable the only housing from this $30 million might be a bridge for someone to sleep under? No. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure Mr. and Speaker, Communities. I'm glad to get up to talk again about Kelowna, a $31.5 million for 20,000 homes over the next 10 years. And Mr. Speaker, how did that member vote? He voted against. Time and time again, the Conservatives stand up in this place and vote against getting housing built in this country. We know there's a supply crisis in this country on housing. Conservatives don't want to build a single house. It's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, how unsafe serious they are about this crisis. We're ready to get the job done. We're getting the job done. I'd like to encourage all members, all ministers, to please wait your turn to answer the question that's asked so that we can all hear the answer. The Honourable Member from Courtney, Alberni. In just two days, Belleville has seen 23 drug poisonings. They've declared a state of emergency because the mayor says emergency services and funding are stretched too thin. The toxic drug crisis keeps getting worse while the Liberals take a patchwork approach. Then there's Conservatives who spread harmful disinformation instead of offering real solutions. 42,000 people have died since 2016. We need a coordinated, compassionate and integrated response. When will the minister finally declare the to toxic drug crisis a National public health emergency. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Of course, our heart goes out to the people of Belleville and their loved ones impacted by this crisis. We agree with the Mayor, this is a horrible crisis. Minister Sachs has spoken with Mayor Hillis to discuss how we can work together alongside the Government of Ontario, guided by our compassionate and compressive approach. People who use substances, their families and communities need us to use every tool at our disposal. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Strathcona. A year ago, a tailings pond at Imperial Oil's Curel site in northern Alberta overflowed. It spilled 5.3 million litres of cancer-causing toxins into the environment. And even worse, it was shown that the pond had been leaking for years and is still leaking. And both Imperial Oil and the Alberta Energy Regulator knew, but they didn't tell the community. And what has this government done to hold Imperial Oil or the AER accountable for this disaster? Nothing. When will the minister do his job and make sure that the land and water that Albertans depend upon is finally protected? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I greatly appreciate the advocacy from the member on the environment and protecting the environment. She's absolutely right, and that's why the Environment Committee called CEO Brad Corson to committee once again just before the holidays, Mr. Speaker. I had the opportunity to hold his feet to the fire, tell him that Canadians are not satisfied with their environmental protection uh, strategy, if you can call it that, Mr. Speaker. The Athabasca River deserves better protection, and the 5.3 million litres of tailings that have leaked into that river are causing poisonings, they're causing deaths, it's causing environmental destruction, and Imperial Oil must clean up their mess. The Honourable Member for Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, as a member of the Aerospace uh, Committee, I was delighted to take part this week in an event organized by the aerospace industry in Canada. This industry 
is a strength for our economy, our workforce, uh, and our global growth. Can the Minister of Innovation talk about the importance of this sector in Quebec and across the country, as well as the way in which we will continue to support the work being done by that industry? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague, the member, for her leadership when it comes to the aerospace industry. Not only is this one of the most innovative industries, but also one of the most important ones in the country. It employs uh, approximately 210,000 people across the country. Last year, our government announced uh, a historic investment uh, $350 million for the aerospace industry in the country, Mr. Speaker. And not only will we have a strong industry, but we will have one of the greenest industries. And we have already indicated that we will have a national aerospace strategy to serve the interests of the nation. From Storm and Dunda, South Glengarry. After eight years of this Liberal NDP coalition, Cornwall is no exception to the housing hell Canadians are facing. Rents and housing costs have doubled, and new homes and rentals getting built are desperately needed. And here's the worst part. Cornwall is finalizing plans for a 500-unit residential project, but is being blocked by a gatekeeper, this Liberal government. Transport Canada has dithered for eight years on plans to transfer an intersection that would allow the entrance for this new project to be built. Will the housing minister tell the transport minister to stop blocking this important residential project for Cornwall? Yeah, good the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, we've been working with municipalities across the country to get housing built. 30 deals under the Housing Accelerator Fund to build 500 addi 500,000 additional units of housing. But where are the Conservatives being found on this, Mr. Speaker? Absent. They voted against. They're going to cut our uh, GST cut on purpose-built rentals. They're going to increase taxes on home builders. They're going to cut the funding and deals we have with municipalities. They do not understand the complexity of the housing crisis. They're going to take us back. We need to build more supply, not Conservative cuts, which is what they are promising. The Honourable Member from Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. What a sad state of affairs with these Liberals. After eight years of dithering and delaying and working with local partners to actually get something done, they don't even know what they're talking about. They couldn't even acknowledge the local issue after eight years of trying to actually get this done. It is one parcel of land at an intersection of Brookdale and Water Street in Cornwall that everyone's in agreement on. The Grand Chief of Aquasasti, the Mayor of Cornwall are all on board and want to get this transferred so shovels can get in the ground right away. Will the Liberals finally get out of the way, transfer the intersection so housing 500 units can, can finally get built this year in Cornwall? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. While the Leader of the Opposition is going across the country picking fights with local mayors, we're working with municipalities to get the job done. We're happy to work with municipalities like Cornwall and across the country. However, what does the Conservative Party have to offer on their housing policy? It is cuts. It's increasing taxes on builders who are building purpose-built rentals. They don't understand the seriousness of the housing crisis. They don't have a plan. They'll take us backwards. We're going to get the job done. We understand this is an issue of supply, Mr. Speaker. We're going to get the houses built. The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lille, Camarasca, Rivière du Loup. After eight years, this government is not worth the cost. The cost of housing has doubled in eight years. After all the years in government and all the money they announced, housing starts have dropped, particularly last December when housing construction in Canada dropped by 28%. Will this government uh, follow our common sense ideas as with car theft and put in place as quickly as possible these ideas? To the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, we see the Conservatives during the hour of question period pretend to care about housing, to bang their fists on the table, to demand more uh, work on the file. But when it comes to actually voting on housing funding, they stand up and vote against, time and time again. Government of Quebec, or excuse me, the Government of Canada has invested $900 million in the province of Quebec. How did that member vote, Mr. Speaker? He voted against it. Wow. Yeah, we the Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lille, Camorasca, Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, instead of consultations and announcements, here are some common sense ideas to tackle the problem. Selling federal lands and buildings to build housing, giving bonuses to municipalities that issue permits faster, and reduce bureaucracy. 
CIBC said in a report published yesterday that in order to lower housing costs, 5 million housing units and homes will need to be built over the next six years. That's a lot of construction. Will this government use our common sense ideas to resolve the housing problem uh, crisis for once and for all? Spall. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Uh, uh, well, they're, if they're asking us to use good ideas like insulting the mayors, then no. It doesn't work like that. On the contrary, they should support uh, and applaud the federal government's uh, efforts uh, to cooperate with the government of Quebec. Uh, there's 1.8 billion for projects in their region, so they'll have it across Quebec. Uh, so if they're just going to complain, we're going to continue working for Canada and Quebec. The Honourable Member for Rivière des Milles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We won't give up uh, on having a monument for the Canadian Armed Forces in Afghanistan. This week, CBC Radio Canada revealed that the Department of Veterans Affairs had warned the government that it was tarnishing its reputation by excluding the Dow's team, which won the competition. Of course, it is ruining its reputation. It's uh, ruining it with all these design firms around the world, which know that Canada fudges the results. Uh, it's done it with veterans uh, by pretending to speak in their name with a biased fake poll. Will it backtrack and grant the winning team, the doused team, the contract? Mr. Speaker, uh, the National Monument to Canada's mission in Afghanistan reflects the sacrifices of 40,000 Canadian military, police and civilians. We listened to over 12,000 veterans and their families in a survey, and overwhelmingly the majority of those responded were veterans, and they wanted the Team Stimson design, and it says it best reflects their input. And when it comes to honouring the sacrifices of our veterans, we must listen to them. And we did, and we'll continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Milil, Rivière de Milil, Mr. Speaker, the competition jury had their fake poll in their hands and they still picked the Dow's team. The jury did a good job in doing so because the Leger firm completely destroyed it. Here is Leger. This consultation does not represent in any way the opinion of the Canadian Armed Forces members, the members of the families of the Canadian Armed Forces members, and the Canadian population. I would add that their poll underrepresents francophones, as is often the tradition in Canada. Will the government grant the contract to the winning team, Doust, and put an end to this type of uh, situation? Secretary to the Minister of Veterans. Mr. Speaker, we, we appreciate and respect the work of the jury members who evaluated the finalist design concepts. However, the Team Stimson design was the one that veterans of the mission and their families felt best represented their bravery, their sacrifices, losses, and those who served there. The results of the consultation, which are public, are clear, and it's important that we listen to our veterans. Here, here. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Nose Hill. After eight years of the Liberal government, towns that used to be peaceful are being terrorized by foreign gangs that threaten our neighbourhoods with violence and arson. And the rate of extortion across Canada is up a whopping 218 per cent. Canadians are living in fear for their lives because of the NDP Liberal bills like C5, which eliminated mandatory jail time for extortion with a firearm. This means dangerous criminals stay on the street and it's time to stop the crime. Will the Liberals reverse this dangerous bill that keeps dangerous criminals on the street? Here, here. Well. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I find it interesting that the members opposite bring up issues around firearms and uh, safety in our communities when they actually just over 60 days ago voted against $80 million for the RCMP that would specifically go to supporting the work of the RCMP on guns and gangs and organized crime. Mr. Speaker, we are taking the issue of extortion very seriously. This is why the RCMP are working with local police, and the Conservative cuts wouldn't solve this issue. The Honourable Member from Calgary Nose Hill. But eight years ago, under the last Conservative government, extortion was down. It was five times lower, and the budget was balanced. And the Mayor of Surrey has taken note in a letter pleading with the Liberals to do something about the explosion of life-threatening extortion in her community. She said she has terrified people in her community. 
Conservatives will restore mandatory minimum sentences for convicted extortionists, stop the crime explosion rates that is terrorizing Canadians across the country. Will the Liberals? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives' tough-on-crime talk doesn't result in action. But what we are doing is taking concrete steps to deal with extortion and organized crime in this country. I said earlier that just 60 days ago, those very members voted against $80 million to support the work of the RCMP. Terrible. Cuts have consequences, and the Conservatives have not learned their lesson that when it comes to dealing with safety in this country, we need to invest in the expertise of our police forces. The Honourable Member from Caribou, Prince George. Earlier this week, 17 Belleville, Ontario residents died from overdose in a span of 24 hours. 14 of those deaths were in a two-hour span. Since 2016, 42,000 Canadians have died from opioid-related overdose. This Prime Minister has spent a billion dollars making it easier for Canadians to get drugs, but harder for them to get into recovery. After eight long years, this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. When will he wake up and realize that his drug policies are killing Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, let's roll the tape back to when Conservatives were in power, where they changed the Canada drug strategy, stripped out harm reduction, Mr. Speaker, refused to meet with community organizers like me, Mr. Speaker, about saving the lives of people who were struggling with substance use. Mr. Speaker, they refused to support communities in the way that communities knew they could work together to save lives and to help people recover from substance use. We will take no lessons from these no. Conservatives. Here, here. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Ottawa Vanier. Reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is a top priority for our government. Yesterday, the Conservative leader claimed he was on the side of Indigenous peoples, but repeated comments from his caucus members, including the very first time they spoke on their First Nations Clean Water Act, leaves their commitment to advancing reconciliation in serious doubt. And I'm proud to be part of a government that is working to create growth and opportunities so that everyone has a fair chance to succeed. To the Minister of Indigenous Services, how is our government already working on economic reconciliation? The Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to my colleague from Ottawa, Vanier, for her allyship to Indigenous reconciliation and peoples. It's a well-known saying, Mr. Speaker, that when people show you who they are, believe them. And so a few lines in a press conference doesn't change the Conservatives' track record on reconciliation, including just, uh, just a few days ago. When you look at the stereotypes that the Member of Parliament from Saskatoon Wildwood was actually expressing here in the House of Commons. Yesterday, we brought together Indigenous leaders and some of the biggest players in the financial sector to speed up opportunities for economic growth. And as John Davey, VP at Scotiabank, put it, it's about putting power in the hands of Indigenous be uh, business. I hope the Conservatives will get on board. The Honourable Member from St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost of their $54 million arrive scam debacle. $11 million went to a company that did no work, 76% of contractors did no work, and the app itself didn't work. And now we learn that these Liberals awarded nearly $350,000 in bonuses to senior executives who presided wow. over this corrupt mess. What the hell is going on? Just I, I would like to remind members, please, to be, to be very uh, concerned about the language that they use. I know the honourable member normally doesn't use such language, but I do ask all members to be mindful of the language that they employ in this House. The honourable parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, once again, we have we have concerns about some of the initial reporting, but Mr. Speaker, we designed the ArriveCan app to help Canadians during the global 
global pandemic. But with that being said, we will never uh, risk the integrity of our procurement process. Mm -hmm. Any contracts that the government issues, we expect to be issued properly. Mr. Speaker, the president of the CBSA has already put in some interim changes on the procurement process, and we look forward to the results of the full investigation. The Honourable Member from Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, last week at committee, we learned that the Liberal government knew about conflicts of interest at their billion-dollar green slush fund. With $150 million that's been embezzled, after eight years, we know that this Prime Minister certainly isn't worth that cost. Members at the Ethics Committee will have the opportunity to call witnesses, including ministers and officials, who now have demonstrated a changing story between what we've heard in terms of facts and what they've spun in terms of narrative. How will the cover-up coalition vote on exposing these truths? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, actually, I'm very happy that the member asked the question because it helps me to remind Canadians that the Conservative, Mr. Speaker, are not only against climate change, but now they're against institution of Parliament, and they're against helping our small and medium-sized businesses, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, Canadians should know we believe that we need to fight climate change. We believe in our small and medium-sized businesses, and we believe in clean technology, Mr. Speaker. Our children and our grandchildren deserve that we act. This is exactly what we're going to be doing, and we will restore governance to make sure this happens, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, Mr. Speaker, what Conservatives believe is that when Liberals know about embezzlement by their insiders to the tune of $150 million at their billion-dollar green slush fund, is that there must be accountability. This minister and his predecessor were aware of the allegations and knew of the facts of conflicts of interest because they were told, but they did nothing about it until they were caught. Their, their members... NDP members and Bloc members are going to have the opportunity to vote on a motion to open this study at the Ethics Committee. So will they continue the cover-up or will they stand for accountability with Conservatives? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Speaker, Canadians who are watching that this morning, and I'm sure there are many, should be really worried about these Conservatives. Not they're attacking anyone who's going to fight against climate change, but even more, Mr. Speaker, what you're seeing on display and Canadians watching at home, they're going to attack institution of Parliament, Mr. Speaker. The entity they're talking about was created by Parliament, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, like I said, we believe we need to fight climate change. We believe in small and medium-sized businesses and we believe we need to invest in clean technology to ensure a better future for our children. The Honourable Member from Cloverdale, Langley City. Mr. Speaker, Bill S-5, Strengthening Environmental Protection for a Healthier Canada Act, received royal assent on June 13th. This bill modernizes the Canadian Environmental Protection Act by recognizing the right to a healthy environment as provided under the Act, strengthening Canada's chemicals management regime and increasing transparency in the way that it is administered. Our government is working to implement the Modernized Act through several initiatives. There will be opportunities for public input and participation in these different initiatives. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change update this House on the implementation? Thank you. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from uh, Cloverdale-Langley City for all the work that he did to advance the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. That's an implementation framework that will be developed within two years of the royal assent of Bill S-5. And through robust engagement with opportunities to continuously improve that framework, we're engaging with Canadians. And yesterday, a, a discussion document was published for public comment and feedback. And now Canadians from coast to coast to coast can provide feedback on the document during our 60-day public comment period between now and April 8, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from South Okanagan, West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, everybody knows that my riding makes the best wine in Canada, but January's extreme cold snap caused widespread damage to grape and fruit crops for the second year in a row. Some grape growers have experienced 100% loss of their vines. And on top of that, smoke taint from the now annual forest fires continues to affect many vineyards. Without government help to replant their vines, many wineries could be forced to close. So will the minister provide assistance to help BC grape growers and wineries survive climate change? 
The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and my heart goes out to uh, grape growers in, in BC and, and across Canada. I know in Nova Scotia they, they've gone through uh, climate change events. Obviously, this is a serious issue. We've been there to support the wine sector previously, and we'll continue to be there to support the wine sector in the future. The Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, with five of, of former World Junior players now formally charged with sexual assault, a dark cloud hangs over the sport so many of us love. One solution is anti-sexual violence training like that which the Sexual Assault Support Centre of Waterloo Region has delivered to athletes since 2015. Last year, myself and others advocated to reallocate the millions to Hockey Canada to fund these uh, trainings without success. This year, this government has another chance to step up and help root out the toxicity in hockey by funding these critical trainings and pushing Hockey Canada to do the same. Will they do it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Amateur Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I'd like to acknowledge the incredible strength, resilience, and courage of athlete survivors across this country who have come forward to tell their stories for a better sport system. How hockey has been governed in this country and the culture of sport and hockey are of great concern to all of us. Our government takes allegations of abuse, maltreatment, and sexual violence very seriously, and that's why our government has launched the Future of Sport Commission. Mr. Speaker, sport is a power of good in this country, and we'll continue to make sure that sport does all that great work across this country that it can while building a stronger, more resilient sports system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so brings the end to question period. Routine proceedings. Tabling of documents. Introduction of government bills. Déclaration de ministre. Statements by ministers. Rapport de délégation. Reports from interparliamentary delegations. Prestation de rapport de... Presenting reports from committees. De de loi des dip... Introduction of private members' bills. First reading of Senate public bills.